Um, hello everyone, let's continue our lecture. So our topic for today would be on foreign direct investment or your FDI. So what is foreign direct investment? Basically, when we speak of your FDI, it occurs when a firm invests directly in facilities to produce or market a product in a foreign country. So we call these uh, investments as your multinational enterprise. Like, for example, if you look at Walmart, Walmart is actually an American company. They invested in other countries such as China, Japan, okay, etc. So direct investment basically reflects the aim of obtaining a lasting uh, interest by a firm in another firm, okay, in a foreign country. So... As I mentioned earlier, once a firm undertakes FDI or foreign direct investment, it becomes multinational enterprise. Um, IMF defines FDI as a takeover of at least 10% of voting rights of an entity in a foreign country. So, pag 10%, hanggang 50% ang tawag doon ay associate. Pag more than 50% pero less than 100% ang tawag doon subsidiary. Pag 100% okay um, ang voting rights ang mangyayari doon magiging parang branch na siya. Okay, let's continue. So, there are two uh, foreign direct investment forms. We have your greenfield investment. So, when we speak of your greenfield investment, we're talking about the establishment of new operation in a foreign country. Like, for example, Starbucks, ano pa ba? Jollibee, okay, etc. Another is acquisition or merger. So, acquisitions can be uh, a minority wherein the foreign uh, firm takes 10% to 49% interest in the firm's voting stock. Majority, on the other hand, is when foreign interest of 50% to 99% or full outright stake. So, foreign interest of 100%. Another example okay, of your foreign direct investment would be acquisition or merger. So, a very good example of your acquisition would be um, Ayala Group and Zalora. So, Ayala Group acquired nearly half of online retailer of Zalora. So, they expanded it into uh, e-commerce. Okay. There is a fusion already of physical and virtual spaces. Thus, they created the what we call um, omni-channel retail experience. For merger naman, and a very good example for that would be, okay, um, uh, Facebook and Instagram, wherein they, they merged, okay, in 2012. To have a better understanding of merger and acquisition, let's try to look at the difference between merger and acquisition. So, when we speak of merger, so basically the firms agree to go uh, form a new single entity. On the other hand, for acquisition, one firm takes business of another firm. Uh, another is that for merger, all firm losses, okay, um, corporate existence except new one. Uh, for ex acquisition, a target firm ceases to exist and buyer firm continues to exist. In merger, uh, it is actually a mutual decision. On the other hand, for acquisition, it could be a friendly takeover or perhaps a hostile takeover. Okay, for merger, it is a bit time consuming. Okay, and the company has to maintain some legal issues. For acquisition, it's quite fast. Okay, it's easier when it comes to transaction. 
uh, for merger, there is dilution of ownership uh, that occurs in merger. When you say dilution of ownership, there is reduction in every current uh, stockholders or shareholders portion of ownership of a firm okay from the issuance of additional common stock all right or conversion of other types of stock into common stock on the other hand for acquisition okay the acquirer does not experience the dilution of ownership so why do companies or firms okay um, go to all the trouble of establishing operations abroad through foreign direct investment when there are two alternatives that is exporting and licensing which are available okay for for these firms okay so when we speak of exporting it basically involves uh, producing goods at home and then shipping them uh, to the receiving country for sale on the other hand when we speak of licensing it involves uh, granting a foreign entity that is the licensee okay the right to produce and sell firm uh, the firm's product in return for a royalty fee on every unit sold so why should uh, a firm choose FDI and why is FDI better than exporting or licensing so foreign direct investment may be both expensive and risky okay compared to exporting and licensing however even though uh, FDI is a bit expensive because a firm must bear the cost of establishing production facilities in foreign countries or of acquiring a foreign enterprise um, firms would prefer uh, fdi to exporting and licensing because of these uh, reasons so the viability of an exporting strategy is often constrained for uh, by transportation cost and trade barriers such as your tariff tra uh, tariff sorry and quotas so when transportation costs are added to production costs it becomes unprofitable to ship some products over a large distance okay so this is particularly true of products that have low uh, of low value to weight ratio that can be produced in almost any location for such products the attractiveness of exporting basically decreases relative to either uh, fdi or licensing so how about licensing let's take a look at licensing so a branch of economic theory known as uh, internalization theory seeks to explain why firms often prefer foreign direct investment over licensing as a strategy for entering a foreign market basically this approach is known as your market imperfection approach so according to internalization theory licensing has three major uh, drawbacks as a strategy for exploiting foreign market opportunities what are these three major drawbacks first licensing may result uh, in a firm's giving away valuable uh, technological know-how to uh, a potential competitor that's the first major drawback For example, in 1960s, RCA licensed its leading-edge color television technology to a number of Japanese uh, companies, including Matsushita and Sony. 
at the time, RCA saw licensing as a way to earn good return from its technological know-how in Japanese market without the costs and risks associated with foreign direct investment. However, Matsushita and Sony quickly assimilated RCA's technolo uh, technology and used it to enter the U.S. market to compete directly against RCA. So as a result, RCA is now a minor player in its home country, while Matsushita and Sony have a much bigger market share. Okay. Next is that the second problem is that licensing does not give a firm the right control or tight control rather over manufacturing, marketing, and strategy in foreign country that may be required to maximize its profitability. So with licensing, uh, control over manufacturing, uh, what else, marketing, and strategy are granted. Okay, uh, to whom? to a licensee in return of course for a royalty fee however for both strategic and operational reasons uh, a firm may want to retain control over these functions so the rationale for wanting to control um or sorry the rationale for wanting control sorry over the strategy of a foreign entity is that okay a firm might want its foreign subsidiary to price uh, and market very aggressively as a way of keeping a foreign competitor in check so unlike a wholly owned subsidiary a licensee would probably not accept um such imposition why because it would likely reduce the licensee's profit or it might even cause the licensee to take a loss okay next so the third problem is that there um with licensing arises when a firm's uh, competitive advantage is based not as much on its product as on the management, marketing, and manufacturing capabilities that produce those products. The problem here is that uh, capabilities are often not amenable to licensing. So while a foreign licensee may be able to physically reproduce the firm's product under license, it often may not be able to do so uh, efficiently or as efficiently as the firm could itself. As a result, okay, the licensee may not be able to fully exploit the profit uh, potential in a foreign market. So these are the three major drawbacks of licensing so let's take a look at an, an example so for example here toyota uh, a company uh, whose competitive advantage in the global auto industry is acknowledged to come from its superior ability to manage the overall process of designing engineering manufacturing and selling automobiles of course that is uh, its management and organizational capabilities so indeed toyota is created with pioneering uh, the development of new production process known as your lean production i think you learned this in your tqm or total quality management uh, that enables it to produce higher quality uh, automobiles at a lower cost than its global rivals. So although Toyota could license certain products, okay, its real competitive advantage comes from its management and process capabilities. So these kinds of skills are difficult to articulate or codify they certainly cannot be written down in simple licensing contract 
Okay, so they are uh, organization wide and have been developed over the years. So they are not embodied in any one individual, but instead are widely dispersed throughout the company. So put it in another way, uh, Toyota's skills are embedded in its organizational culture. And culture is something that cannot be licensed. Therefore, if Toyota okay, were to allow a foreign entity to produce its cars under license, the chances are that the entity could not do so efficiently as could Toyota. In turn, this would limit the ability of the foreign entity to fully develop uh, the market potential of that product. Such reasoning underlies uh, Toyota's preference for direct investment in foreign markets as opposed to allowing foreign automobile companies to produce its cars under license. Okay, now let's take a look at the patterns of FDI. So number one here is strategic behavior. So observation suggests that the firm in the same industry often undertake foreign direct investment at about the same time. Uh, also, firms tend to direct their investment towards certain location. So the two theories we consider in this section attempts to explain the pattern that we observe in FDI flow. So one theory is based on the idea that FDI, it says here, flows uh, reflect strategic rivalry between firms in global marketplace. Um, an early variant of this argument was expounded by F.T. Knickerbocker. So F.T., spelling of the name is F.T. And then Knickerbocker, K-N-I-C-K-E-R-B-O-C-K-E-R. -E -E so he explored the relationship between F.D.I and rivalry in oligopoly industries so when we speak of your oligopoly industries we're talking about um, industries composed of a limited number of large industries for example an industry in which four firms control uh, 80 percent of a domestic market okay would definitely define an oligopoly so the critical view or the critical competitive feature of such industry is interdependence of the major players. So what uh, one firm does can have an immediate impact on the major competitors. So forcing a response of course, in kind. By cutting prices, for example, one firm in one oligopoly can take market share away from its competitors, forcing them to respond with the same price cuts to retain their market share. So uh, the interdependence between the firms in an oligopoly leads to Im imitate behavior. So rivals often quickly imitate what a firm does in an oligopoly. So when you say imitate behavior, Okay, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if one firm raises their price, the others would also follow. If one firm expands their capacity, the rivals would imitate them. Okay, so what happens is that it may become a disadvantage in the future. All right, next, uh, Knickerbocker's theory can be extended to embrace the concept of multipoint competition. So when we speak of your multipoint competition, it arises when two or more enterprises encounter each other in different regional markets 
national markets or industries so firms will try to match others moves in different markets to try to hold each other in check so the idea is to ensure that rivals do not gain uh, a commanding position okay over them and use the profit generated uh, there to subsidize competitive attacks in other markets. Knickerbocker's theory can be extended to ex, uh, to embrace the concept of multipoint uh, competition. When we speak of your multipoint competition, it arises when two or more enterprises encounter each other in different regional markets, uh, national markets, or industries. So firms will not try to match uh, each other's moves in different markets to try to hold um, each other in check. The idea is basically to ensure that a rival does not gain a commanding position in one market and then use the profits generated there to subsidize competitive attacks in other markets. Like, for example, okay kodak and fuji films um they compete with each other uh, around the world so if kodak enters a particular market fuji will not be far behind so fuji feels compelled to follow uh, kodak to ensure that kodak does not gain a dominant position in the foreign market that it could then leverage to gain competitive advantage elsewhere so the converse also holds uh, with kodak following fuji when a japanese firm is the first to enter foreign market Another pattern of your FDI is your product life cycle theory. So Raymond Vernon's product life cycle theory is also used to explain FDI. He argued that uh, often the same firms that pioneer a product in their home markets undertake FDI to produce or foreign direct investment to produce a product for consumption in foreign markets so basically uh, firms uh, invest in other advanced countries when local demand in those countries grow um, it could probably grow large enough to support local production okay so firms invest in other uh, advanced countries when local demand in those countries grow large enough to support local production firms, then shift production to low-cost developing countries when product standardization and market saturation give rise to price competition and cost uh, uh, pressures. Okay, so that is your product life cycle. So location specific advantage uh, or advantages arising from utilizing resources or resource endowments that are tied in a particular foreign location. So an example is that um, a firm's locate their establishments in places where oil is abundant why because there is um definitely low cost okay next is uh combining location specific assets or endowments with firm or firms unique capabilities requires fdi Okay, let's take a look at the political ideology and FDI. So first is the radical view. Um, the radical view traces its roots to Marxist uh, political and economic theory. So radical writers basically argued that multinational uh, enterprise is an instrument of imperialist domination. So basically they see MNE as a tool for exploiting host country 
or host countries to the exclusive benefit of their capitalist imperialist home countries by the way when we speak of your imperialist we're talking about the acquisition by a government of other governments or territories or of economic or cultural power over other nations on the other hand when we speak of your capitalism it's a country's trade and industry is controlled basically by private uh, entities there so another radical view is that no country should permit foreign corporations okay to undertake fdi since they can never be instrument to economic development in other words um, people uh, taking this perspective believe that mne or your multinational and uh, enterprise will fill an important jobs with their home country citizens so to control key uh, technology leaving the host nation dependent on the capitalist country for investments uh, job and technology however there are three reasons that basically ended the radical view number one here is that there is uh, a collapse of communism in eastern europe another is the abysmal um, economic performance of countries that embraced the radical view when you say abysmal it means uh, extremely bad or dreadful and then finally the strong development of countries that basically embraced capitalism okay so aside from your radical view is your free market view so the free market view argues that international production should be distributed among uh, countries according to the theory of comparative advantage okay so your free market view is based on the concept of adam smith and david ricardo okay so again when we speak of your comparative advantage um international production should be distributed among countries wherein there is a specialization of uh, products so within this framework basically your m and e or your multinational enterprise would be an instrument for dispersing the production of goods and services to most or to the most efficient location or locations around the globe next is your pragmatic nationalism okay so when we speak of your pragmatic nationalism uh, pragmatic meaning to say the benefit in terms of capital skill okay technology and jobs so there is fdi or FDI has benefit and basically costs so when you say costs uh, profit in producing the product will go out of the country if uh, your MNE will import raw materials from the home country okay there you go next let's take a look at the different benefits of fdi to host country so number one is resource transfer effect so foreign direct investment can make a positive contribution to a host economy by supplying capital technology and of course management resources that would otherwise not be available and um it would boost a country's economic growth rate okay next is there is also employment effects so basically your fdi can bring jobs that would not uh or that would otherwise not be created in the host country <laughs> all right another is another benefit of your fdi to host country is the balance of payment effects so uh, fdi can help achieve a current um, account surplus mm. when you say current account it refers to the record of the country's 
export and import transactions. So, if the FDI is a substitute for imports of goods and services, or maybe if the MNE uses a foreign subsidiary to export goods and services to other countries, there would be a balance of payment effect. And then finally, okay, there is also an effect on compensation and economic growth. So FDI, for example, in the form of greenfield investment, it would definitely increase the level of competition in a market uh, or in a market that would drive um, down prices. Uh, the result would be it would improve the welfare of consumers. Another is that uh, increased competition can basically uh, lead to increased uh, productivity growth uh, of products and process innovation. It would definitely result to greater economic growth. Okay. However, there are also costs of FDI to ho uh, host country. So let's take a look at the costs. So number one is adverse effect on competition. So subsidiaries of foreign MNEs may have greater economic power than uh, indigenous competitors because they may be a part of a larger international organization. So the MNE could draw, uh, draw on funds generated elsewhere to subsidize costs in the local market. Doing so could allow MNE to drive indigenous competitors out of the market and could create a monopoly competition. Okay, next is there is also adverse effect on balance of payments. So there are two possible adverse effects of FDI on a host country's balance of payments. So number one, with the initial uh, capital inflows that come with FDI must be subsequent outflow of capital as the foreign subsidiary repatriates earnings to its parent company. When you say repatriate earnings, they would send earning back or earnings of back to their own country. Another uh, adverse effect to uh, the country's balance of payment would be uh, when a foreign subsidiary imports substantial number of its inputs from abroad, there is a debit on the current account of the host country's balance of payment. Okay. Another cost of FDI to host country would be national sovereignty and autonomy. So key decisions okay, can affect the host country's economy will, made, uh, will be made sorry, by a foreign parent uh, that has no real commitment to the host country. When you say foreign parent, uh, the company that invested to the host country okay and over which the host country's government has no real control for example uh, if a company would would uh, withdraw their fdi the result is that there would be an increase in unemployment rate to the host country okay However, let's take a look at the benefits of FDI to their home country. So number one is that um, the home country's balance of payments uh, benefit from inward flow of foreign earnings. So FDI can also benefit the home country's balance of payments if the foreign subsidiary uh, creates demands for home country exports of capital uh, equipment, intermediate goods, and complementary products. Next, um, one of the benefits of FDI to home country 
okay, is that employment effects that arise from outward FDI. So benefits to the home country from outward FDI arise from empl employment effects. As with the balance of payment, positive employment effects arise when the foreign subsidiary creates demand for home countries exports so for example uh, toyota's investment in auto assembly operations in europe has benefited both the japanese balance of payments position and employment in japan why because toyota's imports okay some uh component parts for its european-based auto assembly operation directly from japan okay and then the third benefit is that okay um it would arise from the home countries m and e uh, wherein they would learn valuable skills from its exposure to foreign markets that can subsequently be transferred back to their home country. So this amounts to a reverse resource transfer effect. Through its exposure to a foreign market, an M&E okay, can learn about the superior management techniques and superior products and process technologies okay now let's take a look at the costs of fdi to home country so first is the balance of payment effect so the balance of payments um, suffer from initial capital outflow requires to or required to finance the fdi the current account is negatively affected if the purpose of the FDI is to serve the home market from a low-cost production location. So the current account suffers if FDI is a substitute for direct export. Okay, next is employment effect of outward FDI. So if the home country is suffering from unemployment, there may be concern about the exports of jobs. Okay, now let's take a look at home countries' policies on FDI. By the way, uh, when we speak of your outward FDI, meaning to say your foreign direct investment is from home country to a foreign country, okay? So, um, home country's policies on FDI is uh, encouraging outward FDI, okay? So, number one here is there is provision of insurance. So, providing insurance for risks like nationalization of products, what else? War, losses, inability to transfer pro profit, okay, back to the home country. Another is extension of credit. Uh, like, for example, maybe providing loans to found, fund uh, outward FDI and then modification of taxation policies uh, perhaps we're talking about the elimination of double taxation of foreign income so investor countries encourage host countries to relax their restriction to inward FDIs okay Okay, next, restricting outward FDI, which includes imposition of limits or ceilings on outflow of funds. Okay, next is manipulation of ta uh, tax policies. So, manipulation of tax uh, policies to encourage firms to invest in their home countries what would be the result of this uh, they would want to create jobs in domestic 
market. And then another is political uh, reasons. So if the political ideology of a host country contradicts the ideology of the home country. Okay. Next, host, let's take a look at the uh, host country's policies on FDI. Okay, by the way, when you say home uh, country of FDI, we're talking about the origin of that uh, multinational en enterprise. When we say host country, it's where they actually invested uh, or it's where they conduct their business in a foreign country. Okay, there. So host countries policies of uh, on FDI, so encouraging inward FDI, which, uh, which includes provision of incentives. Such incentives may take uh, in many forms, but the most common uh, incentives would include tax concessions, what else? low interest uh, loans and grants or subsidiaries so incentives basically are motivated by the desire to gain from the resource transfer and employment effects of fdi okay another is restricting inward of fdi or restricting inward fdi so, host governments use a wide range of controls to restrict FDI in one way or another. The two most common are ownership restraints and, of course, performance requirements. So, ownership restraints can take several forms. In some countries, foreign companies are excluded from specific fields. They are excluded from uh, tobacco and mining in Sweden and from the development of certain national resources in um, ano ba? Brazil, Finland, and Morocco. So in other industries, uh, foreign ownership may be permitted although a significant proportion of the equity of the subsidiary must be owned by local investors. Okay. So performance requirements are controls. Okay, next. Uh, performance requirements, on the other hand, pertains to... Um, the controls over the behavior of MNE's local subsidiary. So, uh, the most common performance requirements are related to local uh, content, exports, maybe techno technology transfer, and local participation in top management. So, as with ownership restrictions, the logic underlying performance uh, requirement is that such help uh, maximize the benefits and minimize the costs of FDI for the host country. So, many countries employ some form of performance requirements when it suits their objectives. However, Performance requirements tend to be more common in less developed countries than in advanced industrialized nations. Now, let's take a look at a decision framework. Okay, so this decision framework could help determine a particular company whether to export, okay, to a license or maybe FDI or foreign direct investments. So, if there is high um, transportation costs and tariff, all right, the next thing you have to uh, learn is know how amenable uh, to licensing. So if yes, you have to determine if there is tight control over foreign operation required. If no, okay, are you protected by the licensing contract? If yes, then you license. However, if the transportation cost and tariff or tariffs 
are low, then perhaps you can do export. In terms of your know-how, uh, if it's not amenable with licensing, then you do FDI. Okay? If tight control over operation required, okay, is tight or there is a uh, tight control over foreign operation required, okay, then you conduct or you have to go for your foreign direct investment. Okay, uh, if uh, there is no protection in terms of licensing contract, it's better to have FDI or the foreign direct investment. Okay, so this is your decision framework, either to go for export, FDI, or licensing.